the world is changing. It feels like we're at a point of turning, a point of turning in which we, we can change the world from spinning on an axis of cruelty to spinning on an axis of compassion. It may seem to be impossible, but it isn't. See, Alice Walker addresses the need for humans to practice the compassionate turning of the world in her poem, The World Rising. She says, the world rising can put an end to anything. And she goes on to describe all the ways that we can truly change the cruelties of the world. She states that we must first be done with cruelty, especially to ourselves to start again beaming like the sun. And Alice Walker is right. We must be done with cruelty to ourselves, yes. We must be done with cruelty to ourselves. We must be done with harming ourselves with shame, done with guilt, done with fear, done with the fear that we don't measure up, done with the idea that we aren't worthy or not enough, done with the, that idea that only perfection can save us. We must be done. We know that these things don't serve us. So we must be done with allowing them to control us. And we, we cognitively understand that perfection is unattainable, yet, yet we constantly are in a race to be the most perfect. Do you remember when you decided that perfection was the goal of any pursuit that you took? Because I do. I do. I was about seven or eight years old and I got the highest grade on my spelling test. It was a 98. And I raced home to tell my mom about my top score. I was excited. And she looked at the test and she said, well, yeah, it's good. But I wonder how much better you feel if you got the last two points. 100 beats a 98 any day. I was crushed. And I remember agreeing that 100 was better than a 98. And I walked past the trash can on the way to my room and I, I threw the paper away. All of a sudden, a 98 became a failure. And from that point on, if it wasn't 100, I felt that nagging feeling of regret. If I had only done better, it would be The pursuit of perfection is passed along so easily. It is a siren that calls to us, but it will only lead us to destruction. Yet we continue to answer the call. The pursuit of perfection stunts our individual and collective growth, leading us to perform as if we're perfect. And this performative perfection plays out across all areas of our lives. Yet, perfection is not what we need to be our best selves. Perfection is not what we need to grow. What we need to grow is authenticity. We need to make mistakes. We need to act foolishly, to not know the answer. We need to know the sting of disappointing others and of being disappointed. We need to know how to rest and how to find renewal. We need to learn how to covenant. You see, there's no space in covenant for perfection. We need a theology, we need a theology of covenant. And Unitarian Universalist minister Gretchen Haley states that covenantal theology doesn't just say that we become human through our promises. She's right. Covenantal theology understands that we will support each other, that we will honor that we are autonomous people 
with varying beliefs and that we have agreed upon ways of behaving with each other, covenantal theology tells us that we will break our promises to each other and somehow find ways to reconnect and begin again. Living in covenant is the way that we are living into our UU tradition. And how do we live into covenantal theology in these times? How, how do we live into covenantal theology as over 2.5 million, over 2.5 million people have died from COVID-19 in the world? And as natural disasters are battering our ecosystems and as militarized police forces are unleashed on protesters and indigenous people are disappearing from neighborhoods in the thousands as black and brown people or differently able people are being killed and maimed and discarded by institutions and as immigrant women are being sterilized against their consent and immigrant children are being removed from their parents and lost and as and as just just LGBTQIA people are just stripped of any opportunity to have national laws that protect their families and their housing and their employment and jobs are lost and homelessness is rising and the numbers of people are going hungry all over the country are exploding. How can we have anything less than perfection all over this world to save us? How can we? How can we believe that covenantal theology can renew us? How? Yet we know that it can because we live it. We live it every day. How many times have you misspoken and been given the grace of forgiveness? How many times have you made a mistake and been allowed to fix it? How many times have you learned, not practice what you learned at all and been reminded of your transgression? This is how we begin again in love. We practice this covenantal theology in our homes, in our friendships, in our partnerships and in our families. And I am challenging you to practice this covenantal theology with yourself and with others in your social justice communities, in your congregations and in our larger world. I'm asking that you ponder what it means to build a loving world. And does that mean that I'm asking you to forgive without forethought or that you accept the bad behaviors of others? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not asking you to do that. That's not okay. That is not okay. I am asking that you evaluate what the kindest action is in the moment. I'm asking you, how can you respond covenantally? Because kindness does not mean niceness. And I want you to say this with me at home. Kindness does not mean niceness. To be kind, we must consider how the action of speaking or acting will help ourselves or help others. That's it. I'm asking that you examine how your response promotes the ideals of the world that you seek. I'm not telling you to be unkind and allow people just to trample your boundaries. That is breaking the covenant that I hope that you've made with yourself to be treated with a person as a person with worth that you are. It is breaking the covenant that you have made to this community to honor the seven principles that we espouse and the eighth principle that we should. And off, as the author and process theologian Octavia Butler states, Kindness eases change and think about that. What would it mean if part of your covenant to yourself and to others included this idea that in being kind, we are easing the path of change? What will ease the path of change for you to be who you envision you are? 
And I don't mean the perfected you, not the you that you will be. I'm asking you, what will ease the path of change for the you to help this turning of the world toward compassion? Compassion for ourselves and each other. See Octavia Butler, Alice Walker, and our own covenantal theology have given us a path to get us to that change. Alice Walker has recommended the cauterizing of anything that does not serve us in our goal of building a new day. And Octavia Butler is prescribing to us the salve of kindness. And now, we must look at the wounds that we have left untreated in our pursuit of perfection. We must determine who we have harmed and how we seek to get back into covenant with them. So whether we broke the covenant or someone else did, we must allow ourselves the discomfort of sharing space with them. And we must allow them to time to choose when they want to have the conversation. That discomfort could be the place where kindness has a new space to grow. We must allow ourselves to look into the mirror and allow our true selves to re-reflect it back to us. And this won't be easy. We may need a trusted person to hold that metaphorical mirror up to us, up to our faces to speak the truth to us and to allow us the space of learning and growth. And together we can do this, together. We can get to a space of glorious hallelujah. And together, we can turn this world to compassion. See, together, we can give grace and receive grace. Together, we can bring forth change. And together, we can begin again in love. Ashe. Amen. Blessed, blessed be.